All right, fellow Potterheads, get ready to dust off your Marauder's Map, because today's deep dive takes us back to where the magic began Privet Drive. We're talking those early chapters of Sorcerer's Stone, and trust me, there's more to uncover than meets the eye. It's amazing how a story we think we know so well can still hold surprises, especially when we examine the seemingly ordinary moments that Rollin crafts with such care. Exactly. And nowhere is that more apparent than in the stark contrast between Harry's life on Privet Drive and the magical destiny that awaits him. It's like she's setting the stage for a grand reveal, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Take that description of Privet Drive, rows of identical houses, perfectly manicured lawns, it's almost unsettling in its normalcy, wouldn't you say? Totally. It's like a world where nothing unexpected ever happens. And then huh. we step inside the Dursley's house, and it's like stepping into a shrine dedicated to, well, deadly pictures everywhere, but none of Harry. Rowling uses this absence, this visual erasure of Harry, to subtly hint at the emotional neglect he experiences within the Dursley family. He's physically present, yet utterly invisible to them. And it's not just the lack of photos, right? Remember Dudley's birthday when he throws a tantrum over receiving only 37 presents? a perfect example of Rowling using satire to highlight the Dursleys' values. Their obsession with material possessions stands in stark contrast to the true magic that Harry, even without knowing it, possesses. So true. And it's interesting how they constantly remind Harry he's an orphan, emphasizing the tragedy without offering any real comfort. Then there's the golden rule of the Dursley household, don't ask questions. It's practically their motto. And a very telling one. It speaks to their desire to control Harry, to keep him in the dark about his past, about magic, about who he truly is. They fear anything that disrupts their carefully constructed world of normalcy. It makes you wonder if that suppression is partly why Harry's magic seems to burst out in those early chapters, almost as if it's fighting to be seen. Like when his hair grows back after Aunt Petunia's disastrous haircut, or that time he ends up on the school roof after Dudley chases him. What's fascinating is how those incidents often coincide with moments of stress or emotional upheaval for Harry. It's almost as if his magic is reacting instinctively bubbling to the surface when his emotions run high. Like it's saying, hey, there's more to you than they tell you. But it's not all accidental magic, right? There are also those strange encounters with people who seem to recognize Harry, uh. like they know something he doesn't. Those brief but significant encounters, like the man in the violet hat bowing to Harry, serve as subtle hints that he's connected to a world beyond Privet Drive. A world where magic isn't something to be feared or hidden. It's like Rowling is dropping these little breadcrumbs, leading us and Harry towards something extraordinary. And speaking of extraordinary, let's talk about that pivotal scene at the zoo, Harry's first encounter with a creature that seems to understand him on a deeper level. The zoo becomes this fascinating microcosm of Harry's world, you know? Right. Even in a place that's supposed to be exciting and different, the same old Dursley dynamics are on full display. Mm. Like it's Exactly. Dudley gets ice cream. Harry gets a cheap ice lolly. Dudley bangs on the glass, demanding attention, while Harry just kind of observes quietly. It's like they can't help but reinforce his outsider status, even surrounded by actual caged animals. And that's what makes the reptile house scene so powerful. It's like we're suddenly transported to a different atmosphere entirely. The air is still quiet, almost expectant. Yes, and amidst all those snakes, there's this unspoken connection between Harry and the boa constrictor. While Dudley's busy making a scene, Harry's the one who truly sees the creature. Don't you find it interesting how Rowling uses anthropomorphism to give the snake almost human-like qualities? It raises its eyes as if to say, here we go again with these noisy humans. It's hilarious. You can practically hear the snake's internal eye roll. But on a serious note, it's Harry's empathy that really stands out in that moment. He looks at this creature, which most people find frightening, and sees his fellow being trapped in an undesirable situation. Precisely. And that empathy, that ability to see beyond the surface, is something that will define Harry throughout his journey. And then, of course, comes the vanishing glass. Talk about it, did that really just happen moment? One minute it's there, the next it's gone, and the snake is free? Did Harry do it consciously? Did he somehow will it to happen? This is where Rowling's skill as a writer truly shines. By leaving it deliberately ambiguous, she invites us to question, to wonder, to consider the possibilities. Was it accidental magic triggered by Harry's intense emotions, or something else entirely. It's like those earlier incidents with the hair and the sweater, but amplified. And what about the snake thanking Harry, wishing him well? Was it genuine gratitude, or did Harry caught up in the excitement of the moment simply misinterpret it? Such a brilliant detail. It adds another layer of complexity to their encounter. We're left to ponder whether the snake possesses a sentience beyond the ordinary, or if Harry, longing for connection, projected his own desires onto the creature. 
it makes you want to go back and reread the scene with fresh eyes, doesn't it? But of course, the Dursleys, true to form, completely miss the significance of it all. Of course. They see what they want to see. Harry causing trouble, disrupting their carefully controlled world. Even though as readers were given this privileged glimpse into Harry's perspective, his innocence in the whole affair. It's frustrating, but it also highlights the theme of perception versus reality that runs throughout the books. Harry's reality is constantly being shaped by the Dursleys' skewed perspective. And yet, despite their best efforts to stifle his true nature, Harry's magic keeps peeking through. It's a testament to his inherent power, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. But those early chapters aren't just about bursts of accidental magic. They're also about those quiet moments of reflection, those glimpses into Harry's inner life, like when he sent back to the cupboard under the stairs, punished for something he didn't do. It's those quiet moments that really resonate with me. You know, we see this young boy yearning for connection, for answers about his parents, about who he is. Yes. And he's left to piece together those answers from the Dursleys' cryptic pronouncements and his own vivid dreams, like that recurring one with the flash of green light and the burning pain in his forehead. Such a powerful image, isn't it? It's like a fragment of a memory, a clue to his past. Yeah. Just out of reach. And it makes you realize that even though Harry's life on Privet Drive feels ordinary, it's actually saturated with these subtle hints of magic these foreshadowing moments that take on a whole new meaning on a reread. Totally. Knowing what we know now, it's like those early chapters are practically shimmering with hidden depths. You start to see how meticulously Rowling planted the seeds for everything that comes later. It's a testament to her skill as a storyteller. Absolutely. Yeah. She doesn't underestimate her readers. She trusts us to pick up on those clues, to make connections, to experience the unfolding of the story alongside Harry. And isn't that part of what makes the Harry Potter books so rereadable? Each time you delve back in, you notice something new, something you might have missed before. Precisely. It's like revisiting a familiar place and discovering hidden pathways you never knew existed. And those discoveries can be just as magical for us as readers as they are for Harry. I love that. And it makes me wonder, what about our own privet drive moments? Those times when we sensed there was something more to life? Something beyond the ordinary? Even if we couldn't quite grasp it at the time. What a wonderful thought. Perhaps it was a chance encounter a vivid dream, or even a book that sparks something within us. Those moments remind us that magic isn't always about wands and spells. It's about being open to the extraordinary, even in the midst of the mundane. Beautifully said. It's like Rowling is giving us permission to believe in those moments, to trust our intuition, and to embrace the unknown. Exactly. And who knows? By paying attention to those subtle hints, those flashes of magic in our own lives, we might just unlock extraordinary adventures of our own. That's a truly magical thought to leave us with. And with that, dear listeners, we conclude our deep dive into the first chapters of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We hope you've enjoyed this close reading as much as we have. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and above all, keep the magic alive.